Father God, we thank you that you have called us for such a time as this, Lord God. We don't know and we don't understand exactly what is happening, Lord God, but we look to you for help, Father God. We know that you're a good and loving Father, and we want to lift up our eyes first and foremost to you because you're the sovereign creator. You have, uh, you have created all things, and you, you have all things under your control, Lord God. We thank you for each and every one who is here uh, this morning, Lord God. We pray for your protection, Lord God. We pray for the families and for the individuals and for the communities, Lord God. We want to lift up every single person in this room, Lord God, everyone who's watching on the on, on internet, Lord God. We want to lift up our nation, Lord God, our president, our uh, leaders, Lord God. Give them wisdom, Lord God. We want to humble ourselves before you, Lord God, because we know that from you all the help come from. Lord God, we want to ask for your uh, presence to be with us. Lord, we pray for all the authorities and government officials that are in charge of protecting people and people's lives, Lord God. We pray for wisdom for them. We pray for insight. We pray that they would, every one of them would turn to you for help, Lord God. We pray for supernatural intervention, Lord God. We pray for your help uh, for all things. Lord God, first and foremost, we thank you that we can be protected by you, Lord God. Lord God, whatever you are going to bring our way, Lord God, we know that you're in control and you're in charge, Lord God, and we can rest in you. We can rest in your peace and in your accomplished work through our Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, we leave our lives and our families and our whole being into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming uh, to Coastal Chapel this morning. I know you're very courageous, you who are here physically present, uh, and uh, I know that it's also a step of faith. Think about a couple of months back in your life. It's the 1st of January. The new year has dawned. You woke him up, you're woken up in the morning. What were you think that this year will uh, bring to you? Probably not the ki kind of chaos that we're in right now. Just two short months later, two and a half months later, we're in this situation. Shops are going crazy. Stock market is crashing. Uh, uh, whole nations are being shut down. Borders are shut down. All our plans, our vacation plans, and whatever plans we have, they have been completely uh, uh, shut down, and we don't know what's going on. This is what's happening right now in our very eyes. And think about it. This is probably one of the worst uh, national and international crises for the probably past half a century, if not more. We would have never imagined that this happened. But you know what I see in here? We have lived in a bubble. There are three bubbles. I mean, imagine a bubble, you know, a soap bubble. Looks pretty on the outside, right? With all those little colors. And then you put your finger on it, pops. It's gone. Let me tell you, we have lived in three different bubbles. We have lived in a bubble of security. Even though we have all of the medical technology, we have all the science, we have even all the weapons in this country to, to, to defend us, but now it's all gone. There's nothing that human mind or technology up to this point has been able to basically defend or do against this little bug, this little virus that has invaded all our consciousness, even if not, if not our physical being, but our consciousness has been struck by this fear. The, the bubble has been burst. Also, the bubble of the ability of the science to resolve things, that has, uh, that has burst. The science has contributed enormously to our well-being and to the well-being of all of our lives. I mean, I don't think any one of us would want to go back to the medieval dentistry, right? Science has helped us, right? But even science is basically disabled. Now, we're praying for the scientists, and we pray that God would give us the technology and all that we need, but science is not able to resolve humanity's problems. Only God can and we, there's also a third bubble that has burst, the, sci, uh, the, the bubble of entertainment, right? We are used to living in a culture, in a society where everything is fun, convenient, and easy. But 
just go and buy some toilet paper right now is not so easy anymore. It's entertaining though, in it, uh, for sure, to, to read about it, but uh, our life has changed. And now all this chaos that has come on us has made us think about things differently, right? And if you think about this is not the first chaos or first uh, confusion that comes upon humanity. And actually we can see in the early church that when they experienced chaos in this life, they had a certain type of response to that. Now what is your response in this, these kind of circumstances? Panic? Fear? Anxiety? Getting the last piece of toilet paper? What is, what is my reaction? What is my attitude? What is, where do I look for help? What is my security? Where have I invested my life in? And what have I invested my life in? I hope it has not come crashed down right now. And if it has, let me tell you there's hope because we have our foundation, our hope, and our security is not in this world, but it is in our Lord Jesus Christ who is the sovereign creator who controls all, uh, over the, uh, over, uh, all things that he knows everything that has happened. This is not something new. You know, when I look at our uh, scripture today, I want to look at how God is sovereign and how we should turn to our sovereign God in a time such as this. Because God is sovereign over creation. He's sovereign over history. He's sovereign over evil. He's sovereign over evil people. And He's sovereign over all that happens. He's sovereign over all kinds of chaos. God, our God knows exactly what is happening. And now our response should be a prayer as we look to our sovereign God and as we seek His help and we find our security in Him. And we, our task right now is to be a witness to those who don't know this sovereign God of that world that is beyond this world because we are being witnessing God's rule that is being manifested in our through our lives to those who don't know that there is another world, that there is a better world, and that there's eternity, and there's a God who cares and loves and takes care of us. Care, uh, care of us. Let's read today's text from Acts chapter uh, 4, verses 23 to 31. A response of the early church as they went through chaos. Acts 4, 23 to 31. When they were released, talking about the apostles, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign God, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servant to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, scripture. Basically, the context is that uh, the disciples had met with the risen Christ. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Peter is preaching his first sermon, Thousands Become Believers. Things are going from good to great. And then all of a sudden, the authorities take uh, notice of people coming to the Lord, and then they start to persecute the early church. And they throw Peter and John into jail. They uh, threaten them, and all hell breaks loose right in the middle of this great revival. Things were first going from good to great, and then they go from bad to worse. 
kind of something that's happening right now. Things have gone well, but now they have gone from bad, and I pray that they don't go to worse. But we need to be prepared. And I don't know what your reaction is when you encounter chaos in your life, whether that's chaos in your personal life or chaos in your family or society or in a global scale, what we're seeing right now. But when things were going crazy, the apostles have now been released and they returned to the fellowship of the believers and they, they return to the church. What is the first thing that they start to do? Complaining? Getting fearful? No, they come together and they pray. They come together to a unified prayer in the midst of God's people in the church. You know, I cannot stress enough how important church is right now. Church is always important, but in such a time as this, the importance of the church just becomes more and more evident because these believers had one heart and one mind, and they were unified in their prayer to the sovereign Lord. And they understood the power of God's people and the power of the church. They understood that God's eternal purpose is being demonstrated through you, through the church. God does not have an alternative plan. He works through the church. And I'm not meaning through the church building. I'm meaning through church, which means you. You and me. We are the church. And God has purposed to reveal and demonstrate His love and His purposes through you human beings, through you, His children, the church. And God has uh, even, uh, even uh, designed the church to manifest different gifts and different graces so that His manifold wisdom would be demonstrated to all the people around. So when the apostles, when they come together, we're uh, told in verse 24, when they heard, the church re uh, heard it, the report of the apostles being persecuted, they lifted their voices together to God and they prayed. Verse 24, the first part of prayer says, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. What is the first thing that they pray? Are they praying for the protection first? Are they praying for the authorities first? No, they are looking to God who is the sovereign creator, who is the sovereign God who has everything under his control. God who made the heaven and the earth that everything is, uh, that is in them. The prayer reminds us when it, we direct it to God that he is a sovereign, powerful God that he has no need of anything, that he is never out of control, that he has all creatures and all things and all circumstances and all critters and all bacteria and all viruses are under his sovereign power. There's nothing that is outside of his control. He is greater and more powerful than anything or anyone else, and there's no, no thing or no one that can destabilize or derail his plans. There is no such thing that God is surprised at something because he knows things from the beginning and from the end. You know, God's sovereignty and his power must be our guiding light and beacon at this time. We must recognize that even in the midst of tragedies and difficult times and personal chaos, uh, when our plans go sour and when our own uh, mind is confused, then God is still in uh, control. It's not because of our ingenuity or our wisdom, but we need to use wisdom for sure. But it's not that that gets us saved or gets us off the hook. I know there's been a lot of jokes about this whole uh, toilet paper uh, things on, on the Facebook and, you know, Internet. There was one article that kind of caught my attention, <clears throat> and it basically said that this uh, hoarding after the toilet paper is really a symbol of people losing control. Because, you know, when you're in a, in a toilet, and then all of a sudden you see that there's no toilet paper. I mean, you're freaking out. Because you're kind of like, what am I going to do? And 
this is a symbol where our society has been moving towards. We think that we're in, so much in control of every area of our life that we're invincible. Nothing can touch us. And then we have lived, like I said, we have lived like in this bubble that has now been burst. And people are absolutely freaking out. We have uh, forgotten that God is the creator of life. God is the sustainer of life. And God has the right to give life and God, uh, to take life away. Remember when Job was going through his first cycle of dip, uh, uh, trials, he said that naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. I brought nothing into the world like Paul says, and I can bring nothing out of this world. Everybody remember Psalm 139, which says, God, you know my thoughts already from afar off, even the word on my tongue, you know it before I utter it. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You know, we need to let go of our supposed sovereignty of our own life. It's easy to talk about, and I'm talking to myself as well, it's easy to talk that Jesus is my Lord. It's easy to say with my left lips, but when it comes down to, well, Jesus, you truly are my Lord. You're the one who decides what's going to happen to me. You're the one who guides me. You're the one who shows me the way. You're the one who decides when I live and when it's my time to depart. Can you, if, if we don't have that recognition that we need to be in tune with our Creator, the life giver, and that there is a life that is beyond this world, and that our life needs to be connected to the life beyond this life, so that we can witness and experience and know the presence of the sovereign God who's in charge of all things. If we don't recognize this, we will be gripped by fear and confusion and anxiety. Free yourself from yourself. Free yourself to look up to God, to His power and His sovereignty and His plans. God is sovereign over all of creation, over all of life. Even over a death, He is sovereign. Verse 25 forward, let me read. Who through the mouth of our father David, sir, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. God is sovereign over creation. He is the sustainer of life. He is sovereign over life. But God is also sovereign over time. God is sover, uh, sovereign over past. He is sovereign over present. And He is sovereign over the future. In this scripture, we see that uh, Holy Spirit spoke through the mouth of David over a thousand years prior about the coming of Christ about the fact that he would be put to death by evil people and that the life of his followers would be conformed to the uh, same pattern, to the pattern of death, crucifixion, and power of resurrection. That is what we see in the Scripture. God's sovereign rule guides and superintends all of history. Nothing that has happened in the past history has been unnoticed by God. Nothing that is happening in the present has gone uh, unnoticed by God. Everything that will happen in the future will be known and understood by God. And God will use all of these things that happen in the world to bring about His good purposes. Think about it. When Jesus was put to death by cruel people, violently, even being tortured, how could anything good God come out of that? If you were looking at all of those events, not knowing what's going to happen next, not surprising, it's not surprised that the disciples were devastated when they saw what happened. But God used specifically that horrific act to bring about the salvation of the world. 
to save you and save me 2,000 years later. This is how God can turn evil, even evil things to bring about his own good purposes. God knew it, and he was going to use it for his purposes. God has set and appointed a time for each nation and each people. That's what the scripture says. For what purpose? So that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. God guides sovereignly through the nations and peoples and communities so that people might actually come to know him. There's no politician who knows right now what is the best course of action. No matter how smart they are, no matter how many wise men or women they're consulting, no matter what the science says, but nobody knows what is the best course of action to take. But God knows exactly what he's doing and where things are heading. And we need to take, take refuge and understand that God can bring something good even out of chaos. And even beyond that, God knows the seasons and times in your own personal life. You know, he knows your struggles. He knows what you're going through right now. And he is able to get your attention. And he certainly has gotten my attention. And I think God has gotten attention of the whole world now. Because people globally have been living in this bubble that has excluded God. Even people who believe in God live like there's no God. People who even go to church, they think that church is a sort of an entertainment. Or they come here to be happy and feel good. No, we come here to serve the Lord and we come here to look for His help and we worship Him. And God, I think, has gotten our attention. Now, there's a book in the Bible called the Revelation. And, you know, there's, uh, the book of Revelation talks about God's judgment uh, being released upon this earth. And I'm not sure if it's happening right now or not. That's not the point. But how, why does God allow evil to run uh, uh, havoc in this world? So that people would turn to him. So that people would recognize who he is. So that people would be drawn to God and would call out to him for help. And people would come to him in repentance and faith. People, God has gotten our attention. And God has gotten uh, the attention of the whole world. The time is short. I don't know how short it is. But the Bible from the beginning of the New Testament says the time is short. And Jesus says, behold, I'm coming soon. And again, I don't know how soon. Maybe even today. I don't know how soon he's coming. But I know that he is coming and we need to be prepared. God is sovereign over time. God is so, uh, sovereign over past, present, future, the time of the nations, time of communities, your time, the coastal chapel's time, everybody's time, the time and the eternity. He's in charge. But God is also sovereign over evil. God is sovereign over evil people and evil circumstances. That's why in this prayer, this, uh, the, the, the apostles are praying, why do the Gentiles rage? Why do the kings of the earth set themselves and rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one? You know, if you want to follow God, it doesn't mean that everything's going to be rosy. Maybe I burst somebody's bubble now. I don't know. But, uh, you know, when we want to serve God, God has promised to be with us in and through those difficult circumstances. And uh, people and circumstances are going to set themselves up against us. The attack and the opposition and even this chaos that is going on right now should really not come as a, come as a surprise to us. Because we live in a fallen world where things break, where there are viruses and there are things that wreak havoc in this world. This is not, in that sense, unusual, even if you look at the history. When, you know, God knows the circumstances and the people that you come face to face with. It's not a surprise to God. God knows even that coworker that you don't like. God knows the neighbor that 
maybe has been not so nice to you. God knows all the things that are happening. God knew Herod. He, know, he knew Pilate. He knew Judas. He knew all the co-conspirators against Jesus. God never forced any one of them to do evil, but he used their evil choices to bring about the resurrection of Christ and salvation of the world. You know, even right now when we're facing this, these circumstances and uh, people are kind of going crazy. Everybody who has gone to uh, buy something knows that people are kind of going crazy right now. And, you know, at this time, we don't only recognize the craziness around us, but also we recognize the craziness inside of us, right? And we recognize when things are being squeezed, things come out. And when we're being squeezed by the circumstances right now, we recognize that stuff that comes out is not always so pretty, right? And now, how should we respond to evil people and evil uh, circumstances? Now, we as a church has been called to be different. Remember, we have been called to be echoes and reflections of another world, of another reality, of another way to respond. Not in fear and anxiety, not self-hoarding, not self-centeredness, but God-centeredness, right? And leaning towards our neighbor and helping, and especially those who are vulnerable, who are most susceptible to these kind of things. Then we're supposed to be hands and feet of Christ for these people. You know, when Jesus was betrayed by one of his disciples, and when he was arrested, and he was at the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, and those soldiers came, and they grabbed hold of him. The evil people came and were ready to destroy him. What was the disciples' reaction? One of the disciples put out a sword, and he sliced the ear of the high priest's servants, servant. That was the natural reaction for people for self-protection, right? That is a natural reaction of humanity. What this, how did Jesus respond in that circumstances? He took the ear of his enemy and he healed him. And he told the one who had, Peter who had sliced the ear, put the sword back in. The one who grabs the sword will die by the sword. You know, sometimes when we go through difficult times, we think that there's only two kinds of reactions. Only uh, the aggressive self-protection mentality or alternatively, this kind of passive, uh, uh, passive, cowardly submission. But you know, when we look at through the Scripture, there's always a third alternative, which is the Christ's way which is the way that looks to God for help. It's not cowardly, but it's not aggressive, it's not violent, it's not dominance, but it's actually something that shows that we trust in God. We have creative, firm, faith-filled response to a given situation. It's a faith-filled, God-centered response. Something that does not take steps based on fear and anxiety, but who looks to God for help in every circumstance. And whatever the circumstance is, we need to have this prayerful attitude that the Spirit of God who lives in you and in me gives that special wisdom and ability to respond to any given circumstances according to His will. God is sovereign over creation, He's sovereign over time. He's sovereign over circumstances. God is sovereign over evil and evil people. And God is sovereign over all kinds of chaos. Why do the Gentiles rage? There's a chaos that was co uh, coming and happening in the apostles' life in the early church. When they were thrown around, they were, uh, they were thrown into jail, they were being persecuted, they were being violated, they were uh, receiving threats. You know, chaos, I know we have different kinds of personalities here. For some, some person, 
chaos means that, I mean, your hair is a little bit off, right? And other people can tolerate much greater degrees of chaos, you know? People react differently. But we know, generally speaking, that the chaos is opposite of order. Chaos is opposite of order. And we know that when life becomes unmanageable and we become disoriented, then we don't know what to do. That's when we live in a chaos, right? And sometimes we become so filled with fear and anxiety and uncertainty that we forget who we are. Who are you? You're a child of God. Your Father in heaven loves you and takes care of you. He is the one who controls time and history and people and events. He's sovereign. You have to look to God for help and get, your, uh, get rid of those anxiety-ridden thoughts and look to God for help. That's our only solution. Now, there's always a time when our prayer needs to be that firm resolve to trust in God. Now, there are also times when we have the prayers of lament, when we have those agonizing times and moments. For example, when some, one of our loved ones has died, when our prayer is filled with grief, maybe. Maybe our, we have those why God prayers. And when we have those times when the how long, O Lord, prayer comes out of our heart. Right? Those are different types of prayers. But right now, our time is to have the prayer of faith. Our time is to have fully firm resolve in the same way that the apostles, when they were persecuted, put in jail, they looked to God for help. And I think one of the most amazing things here is that uh, when the apostles are praying, they are praying, look upon their threats, talk about the persecutors, and Grant your servants to speak your word with all boldness. And while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders performed. Can you see what the apostles are praying here? They're not praying even for their own protection first and foremost. Now, you can pray for a protection, right? I'm praying, and you should pray, and we should all be praying. But in this prayer, the first focus is on God. God, the sovereign creator. The second focus is, how can we be a witness to an unbelieving world? Isn't that crazy? I mean, this is totally nuts. You have been, you've gone to jail, and you might, uh, uh, you know, you, your life is at jeopardy. And now you're focusing on God and how you can be a better witness. But this is what is happening here. Look upon their threats. God I will leave all of these things into your hands. And now, if I'm reflecting my own life in light of this prayer, I could ask myself, how am I reacting in these circumstances right now? Am I giving a witness about an alternative way to react? A different mindset of the time beyond eternity, of the God's rule that is much beyond our imagination, that do I have that faith in my heart to do God's will? And how many of my problems, now or in the past or in the future, are they really, how much they are related to living out my witness to God? And how many of my problems are related to my own self-centeredness and the things that I don't get even though I want? Am I sharing the gospel with my life and with my words in such a time as, as this? When we're going through difficult times, right now or other times, if we would be just able to lift up our eyes from our problems to the one who can solve the problems, if we would be able to look to God for help and bring our problems to Him, and even in the middle of the difficult circumstances, even if we would be able to think, how the, Lord, how are you using these circumstances that I could be a witness for your glory and for your kingdom? How can I bring a word of encouragement to somebody? 
How can I be uh, Christ's hands and feet to those who maybe cannot go to the grocery store or cannot get the things that they need? How can I be a witness to your grace and your mercy and your compassion and your goodness? What is our prayer life right, like right now? Who do we pray? How do we act? How about a witness to the gospel? The, the apostles were praying, grant signs and wonders to happen. Help us to boldly proclaim your word. <clears throat> let, us, let that be our prayer right now, that we look to the sovereign God, that we reach out to him, that we bring our issues to him, that we look for him to help us, and that we look for opportunities to be God's hands and feet in our actions and in our words, in our deeds, to, the, to our family and to the people around us. Because God is the only one who knows if this is going to last for another week or another year or two. We don't know. We don't have any, humanly speaking, we don't have a certainty about anything right now. But we know that our certainty, and our security is not in us, but it is in God. Let me close with this one story. <clears throat> you know, 2012, some of you remember H1N1 virus. Remember that? Also known as the swine flu. I don't know how many of you got it. Myself and our family were in South America at that time, and we all got it. And it was a, it was a, a terrible experience and I pray that God would protect you and protect all of us. But what, I, what one thing I do know, even though God did not protect us from the virus back then, He protected us through the virus. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but God has protected, uh, promised to be with us. He has protected, uh, uh, promised to be and protect us, whether that is through it or in it. We know that we all our lives are in God's hands. We have been called to exercise wisdom, but we have not called into, uh, been called into fear and panic or anxiety, but to lift up our heads and to be courageous, to be faith-filled, and to look to God for help, and in the midst of all this chaos, to witness for a world that is eternal, that is never-ending, that is God's world, that is God's kingdom, that is never going to disappoint anybody. Let's pray.